right, hello, Rich Folly here. We're at AWP 2016. This is PBS Book View Now. What a pleasure to be sitting with Mary Norris, who is the author of Between You and Me, uh -huh. Confessions of a Comma Queen. You are the comma queen <laughs> of the New Yorker. And now you have a book that talks about the importance and sort of weird world of punctuation and spelling and grammar that exists at the New Yorker, but beyond as well. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Yeah. We talked earlier, right before we went on, I said, did you, you probably couldn't have fathomed that you'd one day have this book, and you said, I hoped I'd have a book, but I didn't know it would necessarily be this one. Well, I wrote all my life, and all the while that I've been at The New Yorker, I've been writing, I wrote a novel, I wrote a memoir, I kept a blog about parking on the street in New York, and it never, ever in my wildest dreams occurred to me that I would get a book out of my day job. Yeah. You know? When did you decide, though, that there was something there and that there was a story to be told and that it went beyond really just punctuation and grammar, that there's a story here about sort of, you know, your own life and also some of the other elements of working at The New Yorker? Well, I started writing posts for The New Yorker's website. They asked me to write a response to a writer named Ben Yagoda who had made fun of our commas in the New York Times. And at first I didn't want to. I, oh, I don't want to write about commas. But then I thought somebody should do it. Somebody had to defend our style. And I ought to know something about commas. I'd been on the copy desk for 25 years at that point. And, and I had the comma shaker. I didn't bring it with me, but one of our legendary proofreaders had this little tin with a perforated top and she'd wrap paper around it and drawn commas on it and that was her joke about New Yorker style. Anyway, this piece <laughs> was eventually called In Defense of Nutty Commas and it ran on the website and it, w it went viral because the New Yorker always had a mystique about its style and I'd broken the taboo. Yeah. And it turns out that people were man really the crazy the to find out what was going on yeah. behind that curtain. So I wrote a few more things about punctuation and odd New Yorker style habits. That's the diaresis, the two dots yeah. above the second O and cooperate. And I wrote about pencils. And then it occurred to me that maybe there would be a book, something called Pencils and Punctuation was my first idea. But then my, uh, I found an agent, and I have to credit the agent for the title of the book and for the subhead, and even the, the designation comma queen was the agent's. What do you find when you're when those blog posts and the book itself, there's a subset of, wor of the world that's really interested and that wants to, and I've seen some of the vigorous debate we talked a little bit about before we went on, uh, over punctuation and about grammar, and, and it's, it's, it can be very vigorous, and especially the people yes. that are passionate defenders of the language um, and they don't necessarily work in your field these are just people that love language but it's a really passionate group of people and you've tapped into that what's that been like and how many of them are there out there well lucky for me there are a lot of them I thought originally that it was interest that it would be of interest only to other copy editors but you know, the language belongs to everybody and English teachers and um, people who work in advertising, lawyers are really interested in precise language, and a lot of ordinary people just have a thing about commas. They believe in the serial comma, you know, the one before and in a series of three or more. Where do you stand on the serial comma? Well, I like the serial comma, but it's not a moral position. Okay. If you don't want to use it and it doesn't create an ambiguity, that's fine as long as you're consistent. But With an ampersand as well? Do you, do, if you use an ampersand, you go serial comma ampersand? I would not do that. Okay. No. <laughs> you solved the, you solved the quandary for me. But. <laughs> you know, you've been at The New Yorker for a long, long time. Um, you did say you left for a little bit, but came back. There is a mystique to The New Yorker. Tell us about the, the publication itself. You mentioned Wallace, or you mentioned uh, some of the, the legendary people who ran the magazine. Tell us about your time there. Well, I've worked now under four editors. Um, when I started, William Sean was the editor. He was only the second editor of the magazine up till that point, with Harold Ross before him. And then Robert Gottlieb, Tina Brown, and now David Remnick. And it's been a little different under each editor. The style, though, you know, it amuses us on the copy desk because we think, well, the editors, they think the magazine is theirs, but we know that we're the ones who have been the stable element all along, and really the magazine belongs to the staff 
more than it belongs to the bosses or even the ones who own the magazine. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we think in our inflated way. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have this vision of you and your work similar to the vision I have of desks at the movie with Katherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy where they're fact checkers uh, and they get calls all the time and Spencer Tracy brings in the computer and thinks that it can do better than the human beings that do all the fact checking. And it's sort of like a John Henry story. The fact checkers, the human fact checkers, of course, turn out to be, there's something you know, that they are able to do that the computer can't. But in, a, mm -hmm. in an era now for you where spell check is part of every computer and where more and more of this is becoming automated, um, what do you see in sort of the change in, in, in language and grammar? Well, spell check is very useful we have to be able to use the new technology and not have it be using us. So we'll use spell check. You'd be a fool not to take advantage of whatever tools there are, but you can't trust it completely. There is a human element. You know, there is context. And um, the spell checker can't pick up the difference between two different spellings of rye, right? Rye bread and having a rye manner, W-R-Y. So what we need to, we need to stay alert to those things. Uh, we used to love the movie desk set when I was in the editorial library at the New Yorker. It's exactly what we did. It was before people could just Google and find out what issue of the New Yorker a piece ran in. We were human Google. Yeah. And my boss in the library, Helen Stark at that time, the only thing I ever heard her say about computers was, well, they do exist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she would never have dreamed that it would come to this. So what do you see, though? You know, because you're not, you're not troglodytes there, for God's sakes. You understand, you just acknowledge that spell check is a wonderful thing. And yet, the world continues to change. You've seen shifts in how we look at language. I mean, you're seeing LOLs, and you're seeing new like, forms of language that may be quite upsetting to some purists, but you seem to be sort of rolling with the fact that language changes and evolves. Well, if you don't give it that, if you don't see that it's the young people who are inheriting it, you know, and clinging to the old ways. I mean, I do it. I, it's what I do because I'm the, the, the vintage that I am. But I enjoy the energy of the things that are evolving in language, and they're the ones who are inheriting it. Yeah. You know, if you don't accept it, you're just going to get left behind, right? So when you wrote the book, then, because um, I, as I read, as I read it, I, I, I get the feeling that it's um, a snapshot of sort of where we are in language today, but also about um, the evolving nature and the openness to understanding how things continue to to change. I don't, I, I didn't get a sense of rigidity when I read your book, in other words. I'm glad to hear that. But a fact checker for sure, and someone who's sort of keeping, keeping us on the tracks. Um, but other publications, we talked about the New York Times and others, have other rules and regulations. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a philosophy that guides the New Yorker. How would you put it into words, what the New Yorker's philosophy is when it comes to grammar and language? Well, I, I guess we, we are part of a tradition and we have style rules. We're copy editors, we're not fact checkers. The fact checkers have their own rules, which are just to get things right, get it, get it right. And we want to get the language right. And if we're trying to hold a tradition, you know, we, we're doing that because we respect the people who came before us and because we want to leave something for the people who are coming after us. But we have to be flexible. We have to bend. I mean, it is, what year is it? 2016? Yeah. It's the 21st century, and a lot of our style things were coined probably in the 40s, I'm thinking. It seems that's when there was a big effort to codify everything after the Second World War. And it's we're chipping away at that just a little, but there's a lot of things that there's no reason to change. Why should we take off the diuresis? It's a bit of a brand now. You know, you see the diarysis and you know you're reading The New Yorker. <laughs> I love that. I love the idea of diarysis as a brand. You have, as you're editing things, you, you look and you know who's written them. You get to look at their names. Over the years, you've edited some of the finest writers in American culture. And you're, you know who they are. You've worked on them. Um, and it's become secondary to you. You know, it's probably not even impressive. And yet, have you ever stopped and thought, Wow, I'm, I'm playing with this incredible writer's work right now. 
Well, I am very careful with all the writers. Um, younger writers, you try to help out by making suggestions and you know, when I was starting out, I was grateful if somebody kept me from making a fool of myself. Established writers like John McPhee, say, or Roger Angel, you're, you have to be careful in a different way because there's a tendency to just think, oh, they know what they're doing and not to be alert for mistakes or things that could be misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. So both established writers and up-and-coming ones need different kinds of of attention. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose, you know, when I first started out, for sure, I had stars in my eyes. But now, after getting to copy edit, John McPhee, when I first started out on the copy desk, now I, he's a friend of mine, which yeah. is really wonderful for me. Yeah, so what do you see now? You see a lot of young kids coming up where, I'm not saying that they don't respect the language. I know that they do. And in fact, a lot of people come to that sort of respect later. But they're, they're growing up in a very electronic world where, where punctuation and grammar is secondary to the, the, the pace of the communication. Mm -hmm. That's going to ultimately have some sort of effect, one would think, on the role people like you play down the road and what's acceptable. Do you see, I mean, do you ever look at it and go, oh, yeah, yeah, what's happening to this? Or do you recognize like a coming tsunami of, of problems of kids who, you know, not raised on it? Is, I mean, how do you look at what's happening now in the way we communicate and how it will affect your job going forward? Well, we worried a lot about this. We worried when the New Yorker started its website because the sheer volume of things, you know, you, if you have a website, you have to put something new up every 20 minutes, it right. seems, like 25 pieces a day would get you know, posted. Just, it's already we, a lot of volume just with the print. You add web on top of it and wow. Well, we had to have a separate department, a, a copy desk dedicated to the web page, to the, the um, website, because we can't lavish that kind of attention on every blog post. But what's happening at The New Yorker is there are serious young people who are trying to bring it, bring the web up to the level of print. And that's what I'm hoping will happen. Yeah. I know the volume makes it difficult, and the pace is a lot faster. But uh, we have to try mm -hmm. to raise it to the level of print. Of course, the difference is that in the web, if you find a howler, you can go fix it. And in that's print, true. In print, you have to look at it and be reminded of the miss. Yes, it's engraved you know? in yeah. stone. And that's... you can sort of look at it and go, arg. <laughs> um, you know, in our last couple minutes, um, you know, when, when you think about some of the things in this book, everybody wants to know things about, like, the semicolon, will they survive? I mean, these are the big, like, you know, like, the <laughs> dash. Is it okay to use a dash? You know, I mean, so often the informality of language today, we move into those directions. Give us your quick take on the dash. Okay? Like it? Oh, I love the dash. Yes. The dash is the most versatile punctuation mark that we have. Yeah, there's the M dash. Difference yes. than from the dash in what way? Well, there's the M dash is the one that can stand in for a semicolon right. or sometimes a, a set of commas uh -huh. or it can even end something and it can begin something. The dash is, and it interrupts. You yeah. know, um, and that's the, it's different in its length from a one end dash, which yeah. is just a, what I call an industrial strength hyphen. Right. You know, the hyphen is very useful, of course, in typography for making compound words and for breaking words in print on the line. But it's, um, and we used to make a 1M dash with two hyphens, right? right. Now we have special thing that we can yeah, make our code own dashes, now. right? Yes. We have code. The semicolon, I mean, it's like in language, one never thinks about whether or not you, as you're speaking, oh, this is where I put a semicolon. But in, in the written word, you need a semicolon from time to time, which are, I mean, is it something that's going to go extinct soon, the semicolon, or is there always going to be a use for something like that? Oh, I think there'll always be a use for the semicolon. That was invented in the Renaissance, and it's held up pretty well. Mm -hmm. I think the one that's the newest in English is the apostrophe, which technically isn't actually a piece of punctuation, but a mark of spelling, because it doesn't affect meaning. Well, actually, it doesn't affect meaning on the level of the sentence. You know, it's not a pause. It's just about whether it's a contraction or whether it's a possessive. But the semicolon, of course, people don't think, I don't think people think in semicolons. I often take them out of pieces. Certainly if it's um, dialogue, I'll substitute a dash because it's a pause that's longer than a comma, but it relates to parts of a sentence 
in, in a way that's different from a period. Yeah. But a lot of times you could just start a new sentence. Well, we're out there right now. Uh, grammar fans are swooning over this conversation. <laughs> and I know that it's something that I think about all the time as someone who's writing constantly about when to use it. I don't necessarily spend time talking about other people, which is what makes it fun. I just suffer through not knowing. And that's why your book has been so helpful, I think. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and it's been wonderful to have you today. Pleasure. Mary Norris, your book is Between You and Me, Confessions of a Comma Queen. Thanks for keeping, you know, staying on the wall for all of us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks so very nice much. to meet you.